Hi, my name's Alex O'Neill and I'm Code's Professional Services Manager and I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on the iComply Expert Series uh, and the new CQC KLOEs and today we're going to be looking at the responsive key line of inquiry. Um, it's the, the responsive key line inquiry, it's a medium sized one, it's smaller than well led and safe but it's bigger than caring. Um, most practices that have been inspected under the new regime uh, have been told that they are meeting the responsive key line of inquiry. There's actually only one practice uh, out of the 207 that have uh, that the reports have been published so far that have failed on being um, responsive. But there are quite a lot of practices where they said that they could and should make improvements over responsive. So we're going to look at a mixture of those of how that practice failed and uh, the suggestions that they were making to the other practices. Um, in a nutshell, being responsive is about having assessed your practice and made reasonable adjustments for potentially disabled team members and patients. It's about making adjustments to suit your demographic, uh, promoting equality, not discriminating and being sensitive to cultural differences and aware of how that can affect dental appointments. Um, it's about having a complaints procedure that's in line with the guidelines, clearly displayed in your practice, is understood by your patients and your team, that your team know how to follow it and that it is followed. Um, so there's no point having a complaints process in place if you're not going to follow it. Um, it's also about where it's appropriate leading to shared learning so that the complaint does lead to uh, quality assurance and improvement of the practice and that's something that can be seen with a clear audit trail to an inspector. Um, it's about having clear processes for dealing with dental emergencies, uh, that your patients are aware of the, the processes and they can access emergency treatments, um, that your patients are aware of your opening hours and that it suits your demographic. Uh, so if you're a busy practice in the middle of uh, London, uh, in the city of London, then you probably shouldn't shut up lunchtime, uh, whereas uh, more rural practices would probably be okay with that. So it's just suiting your patients. Um, it's about having appropriate appointment lengths uh, and appropriately staffed reception so that your team can answer calls uh, and uh, that, uh, that the appointment lengths are appropriate for the treatments and that your team don't feel rushed because of poor diary management. Um, in the main though, in a nutshell, uh, it's about, com it's mostly the main themes they're looking at are complaints, emergency access and disabled access. Okay, so aims and objectives, I'll go through these really quickly, uh, but uh, just to, this is verifiable CPD, so we have to have aims and objectives. So the aim of all of these webinars is to increase understanding of the new inspection regime and help you prepare for inspections uh, to, to make your life easier. Uh, so today we're going to examine the inspection prompts for responsive in the handbook. So we'll look at what they're saying. Uh, we'll look at the examples of evidence the CQC give in the handbook. Uh, we're going to look at how practice has been judged regarding responsive in recently published inspection reports. And I've brought our research up to date. So we've now looked at every report that's been published since April. That's 207 reports. Uh, and we'll go into detail of what, the, what they're finding there. And we're going to explore how to respond to events and incidents using the iComply system. See if we can clarify that for everybody, because uh, it's quite a it's a it's a tricky area of compliance. Okay, so learning outcomes uh, by the end of this session, hopefully you should be able to explain what the CQC means by responsive. Uh, you should be able to describe the responsive inspection prompts and explain what the CQC are looking for. You should be able to respond to events and incidents using our system. And you should be able to demonstrate to an, an inspector how your practice is responsive using the KLOE report. I will show that very, very quickly, but every webinar we've done, we've spoken about the key lines of inquiry report. So if you really want to know that in more detail, uh, you can go back and look at the other webinars on YouTube and they'll be there for you. Okay, so a quick update from the research. Um, 207 inspection reports have been published up until yesterday. Um, 19% of practices inspected are in breach of at least one regulation and are told that they must make improvements. So it's still one in five. Uh, and this is probably because they're looking in more detail. They're looking for that, uh, that quality assurance focus that things are being followed up on. And there's a, an, a trail of that, an audit trail. Um, and 61% of practices inspected have been told that they could and they should make improvements. So this is up, I think it was 59% last month. And it's now gone to 61%. Uh, 
And most practices that are in breach are failing on well-led. So if you've not seen our well-led uh, webinar, then I would point you to YouTube. Uh, it's up there and you can have a look at it and I'll be doing an update on that uh, at the beginning of next year, uh, probably January or February. And we'll go, be going into that in more depth. Okay, so the CQT Provider Handbook. I mention this in every webinar. If you don't have this in your practice, please go and download it from the CQC website. Uh, it really explains what they're doing, why they're doing it, what they're looking for, and it's a really good overview that I think every manager and principal should read because it, it'll explain to you and it'll help you out. Okay, so, and today we're looking at responsive. So by responsive, they mean that services are organized so they meet people's needs. Obviously, that's quite vague, uh, so we'll just look at that in more detail, see what they're really looking for. Uh, the responsive KLOEs are related to fundamental standards. So if you don't have the iComply system and you want to figure out what they're looking for under responsive, what you can do is you can take this section, which is on the screen here, from the provider handbook, and you can cross-reference those regulations with uh, the fundamental standards guidance document that's also on the CQC website, and you can figure out maybe how you'd want to present that evidence. Obviously, if you've got iComply, then you are following the iComply workflow, and you will be building the compliance report that you can show the inspector under responsive uh, how you meet the guidelines for responsive. So you don't need to do that. Okay. So responsive prompts and examples of evidence. Now, I'm not gonna go into this in great detail because I think it's more important to look at what the CQC are actually finding in their reports, uh, but it's actually quite straightforward. They're not, unlike say safe and well-led, uh, pretty much what's on this, this section is what they're looking for. Actually, I'll go, sorry, I'll go through the prompts one by one. So are services planned and delivered to meet the needs of people? So. Are the facilities appropriate? Are appointment times uh, appropriate and met? Are they long enough? Uh, are the providers making reasonable adjustments? Uh, and are they taking into account um, the needs of different people? Um, and is there evidence that the provider gathers views of patients when planning and delivering services? Um, that would maybe indicate that they were looking at uh, satisfaction surveys under this KLOE, but that seems to be looking at more under well-led. What they're mostly looking at under this KLOE is, is how you, sorry, excuse me, is how you respond to complaints. Um, R2, 3, and 4, so do services take into account the needs of different people, including those in different circumstances? Can people access care and treatment in a timely way? And how are people's concerns or complaints listened and responded to and used to improve the quality of care? Now, I won't go into all these bullets here, but there's a really interesting one. If you look on all three of those, there's a section that says that people report that so under this section, they're very much talking to your patients and they will ask your patients, are you aware of what the complaints procedure is? Um, where have you seen it? Do you know how the practice deals with complaints? Or if you wanted to make a complaint, do you know what to do? Um, now, I'm sure most of you know that there was a, um, an OFT uh, investigation into dental practices. And one of the things that came out of the Office of Fair Trading investigation was that there wasn't transparency over, say, pricing and complaints procedures in practices. So it's something that inspectors are aware of. Um, but we'll move on from this because this is in the provider handbook and you can have a look at this yourself. And we'll go and look at what they're actually finding. Um, and so if we look at, say, a typically, this is a responsive practice. So a responsive practice, uh, the practice provided a range of dental services to NHS and private patients. We found that patients were able to access treatment and treatment and urgent and emergency care when required. So the, the, the access was easy, it was simple, uh, they could get hold of the receptionist, they could get through, they could book an appointment and the practice responded to them appropriately. Um, we, found that feedback, we found that patients with a disability or limited mobility were supported to access the service. So reasonable adjustments have been made and uh, reception teams know the questions to ask to assess and to let people know what type of access you have. Or if you don't have access and you can't have access, your reception team know who you can refer those patients to. Um, feedback from patients about the service was encouraged, so the, the complaints procedure was on display. It's comments and suggestions box. They're doing satisfaction surveys, but as I said, they're not really looking at the satisfaction surveys under this key line of inquiry. Um, and acted upon so further improvements could be made. So there's proof in those practices that 
the complaint has been responded to, that something has changed. Uh, they've seen meeting minutes to see that learning was shared and, in, and improvements in the practice because of complaints have been documented. Um, there was an accessible complaint system in place, I've spoken about that, so that concerns could be managed effectively. So a less responsive practice. So this practice, uh, they found that the provider wasn't meeting the regulations uh, and they told them to take actions. So patients could access uh, treatment and urgent and emergency care. Uh, however, they found that patients weren't able to contact the practice by telephone to schedule the appointment. Um, I won't go into that into too much detail yet because I've got quotes from that practice on a later slide. Um, these findings did not always ensure effective and timely treatment and the support of patients with dental pain. Because obviously if the patient can't get through to the practice and they're in pain, then they can't book an appointment, quite obvious. Um, staff told us the practice did not always schedule enough time to undertake an assessment of the, each patient's needs. So five minute checkups aren't necessarily always a good idea. Um, I won't say how long your, your examination appointments should be, but if your patients are complaining that, or, or lots of them are complaining that uh, they're not having enough time for their appointments and your team also feel rushed. Um, we'll talk about this in more detail in a few slides, but it's, it's very important to make sure that there's enough time in the diary, obviously, and that your team don't feel too pressured. Um, okay. uh, they also found there's a lack of an effective system in place for acknowledging, recording, investigating and responding to complaints made by patients. Uh, so they reviewed a sample of five complaints which had been made and four out of the five hadn't been investigated or responded to. So this practice is the practice that failed on responsive. And the main thing they failed on was complaints uh, for not having an effective system, not investigating them, not responding to them, not uh, being in line with GDC standards uh, on complaints. So whether or not they reported them to the GDC, I don't know, but that could be very, very serious because that's a breach of the GDC standards. Uh, and they do have this vertical communi uh, sorry, horizontal communication where they are supposed to report those sorts of issues to the GDC. So the re responsive report sections. Um, the first one is responding to and meeting patients' needs. These are the sections when the CQC publish their reports that they write under these four headings on the responsive section of the report. So we'll look at those in a bit of detail. Um, so responding to and meeting patients' needs. So this comes down to information in waiting rooms, uh, appointment times meeting the needs of patients and don't pressure the team, um, waiting times in the practice and waiting times for appointments. Uh, so talking to the patients, finding out, you know, does this practice run late? Do you have to wait a long time to get an appointment? Can you get through to the practice? Um, that it's appropriate to the local demographic. Um, there's, there's a bit in there with equality and diversity. So, you know, if, if you've got a, um, uh, if you're in a, an area where there's a particularly prevalent language due to a local uh, ethnic group, then maybe you should have translation services available or team members who can translate for you. Um, and also, you know, appropriate to the demographic within opening hours. Um, so if you were a busy practice in the middle of the city of London, closing at lunchtime might not be a good idea and might annoy your patients. Uh, if you're in a rural area, then it's probably uh, it's okay. But making sure that your opening hours and the appointments you offer are tie in with the sort of people who use your service. Um, systems in place to deal with emergencies, so triaging patients by asking appropriate questions. So, um, do your reception team know the questions to ask to to determine whether or not it's a real emergency? So, uh, is it you know a recement crown or is it um, you know terrible decay and toothache? or um, a dry socket. So tackling inequity and promoting equality, this is to do with disabled access and that reasonable adjustments have been made. Uh, understanding uh, different cultures and beliefs, um, this is to do with equality and diversity training, and I've already said adjustments for different languages. Access to the service, uh, there's a bit of overlap in these by the way, uh, but timely appointments that meet the need of the demographic, as we said before, um, emergency arrangements that are clearly displayed. So your patients know, so just basically having your hours up on the wall and having your emergency details up on the wall, on your website, on your, tele on your answering machine, so your patients know what to do in a case of an emergency. And a suitable phone system and appropriately staffed reception, uh, as we'll see in a few slides time, but obviously making sure that uh, if you're a five chair practice, then having one 
that's always busy having one receptionist isn't going to work or having a phone system that doesn't do holding isn't necessarily going to work. So you may need to think about your phone system and whether or not it's appropriate for the number of surgeries you have. So then uh, that's access to the service and concerns and complaints. So clearly displayed policy and procedure. We've already discussed that. A comments and suggestions box was mentioned on one report. Uh, complaints procedure followed. Complaints responded to in the defined timescales. Uh, complaints tracked and they're easy to follow for an inspector. So we're going to talk about this more in a bit, but ideally you want to have a complaints folder where you can see the complaint that came in, how it was responded to, any communication, what was done about it, and uh, what was implemented in the practice to maybe stop it reoccurring. And we do that obviously and I comply with the uh, event records, uh, which we'll discuss in a bit more detail. And do patients feel that practice takes complaints seriously? So they will talk to your patients. Okay, so. Looking at the actual reports themselves, um, these are quotes from a responsive practice. So you can see with the first one there, we looked at staff files and saw that they'd attended training as part of their CPD in ethical and legal issues. Uh, the dentists and staff explained that the training covered issues around equality and diversity. So they are looking at equality and diversity under this key line of inquiry. Uh, we recently updated all of our modules on this um, and we discussed that in a previous webinar. Um, but you may want to go back and have a look at those modules, refresh your memory on those if you're particularly looking at the responsive key line of inquiry. Um, and if you want extra training, we've just released a new DVD uh, on equality, diversity and human rights um, with a fantastic presenter called Anne Kambata who actually clears that whole area up. So uh, you can go to the Code Market website and you can get that DVD for yourself and your team if you want training on that. Uh, for the next one, uh, we saw that the practice received one complaint in August 2014. Uh, it led to a consultation within the organisation uh, the provider subscribed to for indemnity, insurance and guidance, so MDU, uh, sorry, DDU or dental protection. After consultation, we saw there was an amendment to practice procedure uh, and we saw there was a discussion of the changes at a staff meeting. So it's obviously a very, very clear audit trail in that practice. Uh, probably for any of you who've worked in corporates, uh, they usually have very, very clearly defined complaints procedures and complaints tracking processes um, where you have to keep a folder, which we do in iComply as well. Uh, and it's a very good way to do it. Um, and obviously they could see on the staff meeting minutes how changes have been made. So learning had been shared, improvements had been made, and they could maybe even see those improvements in the practice. Um, appointment times varied in length according to the proposed treatment and to ensure patients and staff weren't rushed. So they will ask your team, do you feel that there are appropriate appointment times here? And obviously if they walk into your practice, sit in reception, which they're going to do, and they see that everybody's running late and emergencies are being crammed in everywhere, then perhaps that's going to be a problem. So I always say to practices, it's very good to have emergency slots in your diary. A few emergency slots each day uh, that you book like a GP almost, you know, people know to ring up first thing in the morning if they want an emergency slot. Your reception team are trained on how to triage emergencies. And um, yeah, and, and then you can have a good emergency system. If you've got a full diary, and you're constantly trying to slot in emergencies, then you could maybe lead to the sort of issues that practices have had with the CQC when the inspectors have come and looked at this. Um, so new, practice, new patients were made aware of access limitations if they contacted the practice by telephone. The practice was able to offer treatments at their sister practice, which we were told were fully, was fully accessible. So we'll talk about this in more detail on the next slide, but it's, it's important to assess your business um, and to assess your business regarding disabled access and make reasonable adjustments. Uh, and if you can't make those reasonable adjustments, then know where you can refer your patients. Um, and then at the bottom we've got, there was an accessible complaint system in place so concerns could be managed effectively, uh, which we've discussed already, but obviously it's transparent to the team and it's transparent to uh, your patients as well. Okay, so not responsive. So this is where I think we get more detail and we see where practices have been actually pulled up by the CQC for not being responsive. Um, so the top one there, six patients reported through comments cards and on the NHS Choices website. So as part of the uh, inspection regime, they are looking at your NHS Choices before they come in the practice. So we're always saying you should, um, it's always our advice that you should manage your online presence and respond to all 
online reviews, uh, whether they are uh, on NHS Choices or Google Reviews or Yelp, um, and you should always respond to those um, and, and make changes. Consider those to be events that you need to deal with or complaints that maybe haven't been made directly. Um, so staff, uh, staff told us that though they tried to ensure there were always two people at reception, at, uh, sorry, staff told us, although they tried to ensure there were two people at reception at all times, Okay. However, they often were asked to do other tasks by the practice manager, which left the reception understaffed. So obviously patients are trying to call this practice, they can't get through, and it's only one receptionist with probably one phone line, uh, which is reinforcing what we were saying earlier. Um, the practice manager wrote a letter the same day acknowledging the receipt of the complaint, saying they would investigate. A date for the response was not given, and the dentist said they'd expect to respond within six months. Uh, now, obviously, that's completely outside of GDC guidelines and national guidelines. Uh, if uh, Wales, Scotland, Ireland and the UK all have different complaint response guidance, we've just updated our documents on this. Uh, so there's a new G1, uh, G110, problems, uh, complaints, problems and events, and a G110C, a new complaints procedure. Uh, so you can go and have a look at those and make sure that what you're doing is in line with, the, with those guidelines. But obviously six months is uh, ridiculous and uh, no wonder the CQC pulled them up on it. Um, we looked at the practice's procedure for uh, acknowledging, recording, investigating and responding to complaints and found there was a lack of an effective system. So they, they just didn't have a system and, and my, my team see this all the time. We go into practices and the complaints are in the the emails, they're dotted around the practice, they've got a complaints folder but they're not using it. Um, so it's very good to have a proper complaints folder, which is what we're going to talk about when we're talking about how to deal with events and complaints in a bit. Um, one patient specifically commented on how brief their appointment was. Uh, obviously, that's only one patient, uh, but the CQC felt it was important enough to write about it. So. Um, the may, they may have had concerns there in the practice. So when you get a CQC inspection and you get the report, you want to pay attention to what they're saying in your report um, because they may not fail you on things, but they may write certain things that you should pay attention to. And, and if, you'll get, if you get notified of a new CQC inspection, one of your first things to do should be going, to go and look at your last inspection report because maybe the inspector wrote a few things that he wanted you to pay attention to and, and then the next inspector will definitely look at that. Okay, so the last one there, no assessment had been carried out in accordance with the Disability Discrimination Act. This should be done to identify action that could be taken to help patients with varying disabilities, even with the constraints po posed by a, a historic building. Okay, so the Disability Discrimination Act was superseded by the Equality Act. Uh, I just wanted to clarify this point. Practices don't have, there is no requirement to do a disability access audit anymore. Uh, so this actual report is slightly out of date or the inspector hadn't quite realised that. However, um, you are required to make reasonable adjustments under the anticipatory, anticipatory duty of the Equality Act, which means that sort of people you could expect in your practice, generally speaking, people who are hard of hearing, uh, have poor eyesight, or maybe wheelchair users, you should make what are called reasonable adjustments for them. And it's an anticipatory duty, which means you need to do it before you have those patients. So things like getting a hearing loop or a magnifier uh, for uh, or large print, braille, things like this, um, you should do. And you should carry out an assessment yourself on your practice in order to figure out what you need to do because there may be things in your demographic um, which mean that you need to uh, have more of a provision for a particular disability. Um, and we are actually going to release, I think it's next month, we're going to release a, um, an audit tool for you to do that for your practice. Uh, so that's upcoming in iComply right now. It's being peer reviewed by the team at the moment. And we're going to release that probably in a month or so. Okay, so responsive surface signs. So I always think this is a really good thing to talk about is if an inspector walks into your practice, um, what's immediately going to hit them or maybe with a little bit of an investigation to, to show that you are responsive or that you're not responsive. So. The first one there, clear information regarding access and emergency appointments. So on your website, on your answering machine, patient information leaflet, on your boards, and obviously that your patients know. Um, an appropriately staffed reception. So have you got enough, enough of a reception team to deal with patients and those incoming calls in order that you can respond appropriately to patients who are in pain? 
your complaints procedure is on display. Um, most practices are doing this now. It's an absolute 100% duty that you must have it on display. It's a requirement uh, and it must be somewhere prominent. I, I go into practices sometime where they've, they've shrunk it down to something less than A5 size or it's on a wall in the corridor and it's sort of hidden away. Um, you, you don't want that. You want your patients to complain to you uh, because if they're complaining to you, they're not complaining to the GDC or anyone else. Um, so you, you want your complaints procedure on display, prominent. You want to embrace complaints. It, it's great if people complain because then you can improve your practice. Uh, reasonable adjustments for disabilities and, and demographic. Uh, you know, if, if you are, um, you know, if you're next to a disabled school, then, uh, you know, the, the, the inspector would expect you to be kitted out to meet the needs of the disabled patients. Uh, if you're in a an area that's uh, predominantly, um, I'm trying to think of a language, Urdu speaking, then you should probably have someone in the practice or have access to an Urdu translator. Um, team understanding of procedures, adjustments, and how to respond. So the team know what you've done to meet uh, these requirements. They know what your procedures are. They've been trained on them and they know how to respond. Uh, so I was in a practice the other day and I asked the receptionist, could I have a copy of your complaints procedure? Uh, or how would I complain to the practice? And uh, the receptionist didn't know, which obviously uh, the receptionist really does want to know how to do that. Okay, so how I comply helps you to be responsive. So we've got the complaint step, uh, which helps you to manage complaints. Uh, the optional audit of complaints, which is optional in iComply, but it's very, very good uh, to make sure that, that you have dealt with them, that you have responded to them, you have made any improvements. And we've updated all of our documents. We've updated all of our complaints documents. G110 has been updated um, this week, or end of last week. G110C, uh, which is the pr complaints procedure, has been updated. We've got an upcoming disabled access assessment, uh, which should be coming next month. Uh, we've got the Equality, Dignity and Human Rights step and we've got the training DVD should you wish to purchase that. We've got the Disabled Access step. Um, we've got the KLOE report responsive prompts. Uh, we've got free webinars and guidance based on actual inspection reports, which is what we're doing right now. And we've got full compliance health checks. So if any of you feel that you're not responsive or you're not sure where you're, where you're uh, not meeting the requirements or you'd like to know in more detail what the requirements are, uh, that's something that we do on our health checks where we go and visit a practice for a day and we spend a day with the manager or the principal going through everything, letting you know where you should be and letting you know where you are. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about now, uh, obviously this is, <laughs> this is some of our new branding, uh, but to be compliant, you just need to use your mouse. Um, and that is obviously iComply, which you, uh, the majority of you are using. Um, so what I'd like to talk about now is managing events in a practice. So it's been about 10 minutes on this, um, and then and we'll have a look at iComply and what you can do. Um, and then we'll, we'll have about 10 minutes on questions or something. Um, so with managing events, it's, I've used the word events here uh, because it's a, a bit of a gray area, not a gray area, it's a muddy area. It's a, a difficult thing to understand. Um, so I'm gonna try and clarify that for you. Now, now for some of you who are on cycle two, who've done your first year of compliance, you should have this system all set up. So hopefully this will help you to understand how it works or how it should work in the practice. Um, for those of you who are in your first year of iComply, then you may have a complaint system already in place or an event system, incident responding system already in place. And by the end of your first cycle, you will have transferred over to the iComply system. But if you want to get a head start with it, then I will, uh, then this will explain how that, how that could help you out. So what we have basically in, in iComply, um, we've got two months that, that deal with, with events, incidents, complaints, uh, and that's month two and month nine in the cycle. Um, the things at the top of the screen there, complaints, problems and events, safety incident reports, etc. They are all in month two. And then at the bottom, the other two there are in month nine. But you should almost consider them part of the same system because if something happens in your practice, then you need to respond to it. You need to figure out what it is. Uh, you need to figure out who you need to report it to. So hopefully I should clarify that for you. So, so where you want to start is you want to download G110, the new updated version, and you want to have a read of that. Uh, that's been updated. It's a, it's, uh, we've improved it a bit and we've added a bit more log sort of a logical flow to it so people can understand how they should respond to these things. But generally speaking, I'll, I'll, I'll mention a bit about complaints, but I'm mostly talking about events. Um, 
So, you, so the first thing you want to do is, I would say, is if you want to set this up and you've not got it set up already, is you want to go to iComply and you want to find these documents and you want to download them. And the way that we do that is in the template documents section. So if you just bear with me, I'm just going to log into uh, iComply. I'll share my screen and then I'll show you how to find those. Not all of them. I'll show you how to find some of them. <laughs> Okay, so everyone should be able to see iComply now. So that list of documents that was on the previous slide, um, if you want to find any of those, then all you need to do is go over to here to template documents, uh, and you can just click on templates documents. Uh, what you can actually see is most of them are listed down here actually in the news, the majority of them because they've been updated in this latest update. So if you want to find any of these documents, you just go to template documents here, and you can just type in the code. So for example, G110. So the first thing you're going to want to do is set up your complaints folder. Now in iComply, this is folder six. Uh, and inside that folder, uh, you want to have a copy of complaints, problems, and events. Uh, and there are other things you need to, need to have in there, but essentially there should be event records of events, things that happen and the event register. So if you want to download any of these, you could just download them from here. So I'm going to download the event record G110A. So I would make, I'd also make sure your complaints procedure is up to date. So you can see here we've got the latest version of G110C, and that's on version 2 at the moment. That was just updated. OK, okay so. You've downloaded, downloaded G110, you've, you've had, had to read about that and you're up to date on, on how that all works. Uh, you've got, got your complaint procedure, G110C, you've downloaded that, you've adopted that to your practice, you've adapted it and you've put that up in your waiting room. Now, something happens in your practice. Now, if it's something that makes you think that you need to write it down, then that's what I would call an event. So it's an event, it's something significant that happens in your practice. Now, if you have an NHS contract, then you're supposed to carry out significant event analysis on anything that happens in your practice that you have, that you have reported internally. Um, so you'd record this using G110A. That would be your first step. Now, G110A is your cover sheet for anything that happens. You can use these for complaints, serious incidents, safety incidents, and you use this as your cover sheet. So I would almost expect, if I go into a practice, that I would see one of the, in the, in the complaints file, I would see plastic sleeves with this at the front and all the other documentation behind, and this is sort of your log of what's happened. So you always want to fill one of these out and write it down. Now, if you're an NHS practice, as I said, you may need to analyse that under significant event analysis. If you've not got an NHS contract, then the CQC are looking that you are analysing these things internally anyway, so you should do it anyway. Now, once you've done this, now let's just say that I'm not going to talk about resolving this complaint or resolving this issue because there's too many variables there. Uh, but let's just put that to one side. And with this incident, you need to figure out, is it reportable? So is it a safety incident? Is it a serious incident? Now, under the NHS, there are different guidelines for that. So to figure that out, a very quick way and an easy way is if you go into iComply, and you, and you click, click on, on search, search, then you just, just type, type in safety, safety incident. incident. And there's a step there called safety incident reporting. Now, if I click on this, what I've got at the top here is a definition of a safety incident. So I can decide whether or not what has happened in the practice constitutes a safety incident or not. Now, if it is a safety incident and I have an NHS contract, then I will have to report that using the National Reporting and Learning System if I'm in England or if I'm in Wales. You've got the details here as well on how to report it. So that's for safety incidents. Now, if it's a serious incident, then I can go to, or if I think it could be a serious incident, then I can click on search here. Sorry, and I can type in serious incident. 
and we've got an updated definition based on the latest NHS definition of whether something is a serious incident or not. Now, if I then decide that it's actually a serious incident, then I have to report it to my local area team or to my local health board if I'm in Wales. So, and you have to follow the local reporting procedure, so that will be different. So if you don't know what your reporting procedure is to your local health board or to your um, local area team, then I just advise giving them a call and asking them, and they'll tell you what it is. So if something's happening in the practice, it's going to be an event that we need to analyse anyway. So we've filled out the G110A, the cover sheet for the event, and we're going to put anything that goes behind that. We then need to figure out if we have an NHS contract, if it's a serious incident, or if it's a safety incident, and whether or not we need to report that. Now, then it gets a little bit more complicated, because if it involves a medical device, or if it involves a, a drug, then it could be reportable to NHRA under adverse reaction and drugs. So, so there's, there's a policy that we have, which is M233 ADR, which will go into detail of that. And also, also in I comply, there's an adverse reaction to drug step. So you may need to report it to that. that. Once, Once you've done that, you may need, need to report it to a regulator. So, so we have, have in I comply the notifications. CQC notifications. Compliance, compliance review as well, well which, which will, will guide, guide you through what you have to notify and why. why. Now, now, if you're in another region, another nation, nation, uh, nation then you'll, you'll have, have different, different reporting and you can just contact HIW or HIS and find out what they want reporting to them. It's on their websites, websites as well. So, going, going back through that flow, something, something happens in a practice, we fill out an event, event record. We analyse it internally using significant event analysis, whether we have an NHS contract or not. We then can check on iComply uh, under the definitions of serious incident and safety incident if we have an NHS contract to see if it needs to be reported or not. And then if it's a serious incident, most likely we will need to escalate that to a regulator. And you can figure that out by speaking to the regulator or looking at the M233 NTC policy. What, what you also may need to do is, if it's a medical device, if it's a medical device or it's a drug, you might need to report that to NHRA as well. And then what you need to do afterwards is show shared learning. So in I comply, when something happens like that, each month you've got a practice meeting. So what you want to do is go to the practice meeting for that month. Take down here. Go to template. Related, related templates, and, and download, download your, your pre-populated agenda, agenda that you've got, got and then add the thing that you want to discuss as an item to that agenda. agenda. Then, then when you complete the step in item line, there's an additional thing you might want to do. You can type in the evidence box, you can type what, you can type uh, notes that are related to that um, notes that are related to that incident and what you've done. You can then also, if you want to, you can go up to here, if you'd like it to appear on your compliance report, and you could just schedule, schedule you to do, do if, you if there's anything you want resolving, resolving and you want to delegate, to delegate it to a team member. member. So, so for, for example, example and you'd like, like to show on your compliance report, report to an inspector. inspector. So, so you, you can, can say, say you've, you've had, had an incident, incident where um, someone, someone tripped, tripped up, uh, in the front of the practice, practice and you noticed, noticed that there was a chip on a tile, so the responsibility would be for me to organise organise uh, builder to fix tile. And then I can put that I want to do that next week or next month. And then I can choose who that's delegated to as well. I'll just I'll delegate to myself. myself. I click, click create. create. And it's now it's now appeared, appeared on the calendar in December. December. And when I when complete, I complete that, that, that will that appear, appear on my, my compliance, compliance report. report. So just, so a, just little a little bit about, about the compliance, compliance report, report before, before I finish. finish. I've got two, two minutes. minutes. 
a bit, uh, about, a bit about the compliance, compliance report. report. To check, check the compliance, compliance report, report for responses, so, so your inspector, inspector comes, comes in, in, you just want you to click, click on, on the compliance, compliance report, report down, down here. here. Click, click on, on key lines, lines of inquiry, inquiry and inspection, inspection prompt. prompt. Click, click toggle, toggle, click on responsive, and then, and then click, click to apply the filter. filter. And then, then you'll be, be able, able to show the CQC, CQC inspector what you did, when you completed it, what, what, what notes you've written, and where, and where the, the evidence, evidence is stored.